guys, my name is Teo Ho and I am Tudor Box's life science tutor. Welcome to Tudor Box Live in conjunction with COVID-19 catch-up sessions. Now, let me tell you just a little bit about myself. Please note that I am not 14 years old. I may look 14, but I am not 14. A lot of people say that I look like that, but mm -mm, I am way older than that. Um, I study at the University of the Witwatersrand. I am doing biomedical engineering and this is my fourth year. Wow. <laughs> it's been a whole journey, guys. It's been real. But anyways, yeah. So I love biology, right? This is that's the reason, like, you know, why I decided to tutor biology. I love it. Like it's just so interesting when you're able to study um how living organisms are, like, you know, from the smallest unit that it is, like, you know, the building block of it, going into, like, this large living organism, like, you know, I mean, like, with humans, we start off with one cell, and now here we are, full-grown human being, you know what I mean? So, for me, biology is just such a beautiful subject, because it just, like, you know, provides an explanation, it's like how we, like, you know, process energy, how we move, how we breathe, how we do all these things, and this all just reflects the wonderful work that God has done. Okay, so I chose to tutor biology because, believe it or not, I was once upon a time a student like you. I used to struggle with bio. I never used to get the marks that I wanted to get, so I never understood why. Then I figured out, like, you know, in my varsity years that, hey, bio is actually not that difficult. I just didn't, like, you know, focus on the small little things, like the building blocks and stuff, because bio adds on. What you learn in grade 10 comes up in grade 11 and then it also finishes up in grade 12. And also, like when I did biology in university, because I do biomedical engineering, like the work that we had done there, it was like, okay guys, so this is what you learned about the cell. Now we're going to go deeper into that and deeper into that. And as we were studying that, I just noticed that I missed out on so many things that I could have underst understood in high school and I would have like, you know, done better you know so i want to help you guys because i know i was in your position i used to confuse myself i used to like not focus on specific things but now i'm here to help you and i hope that this video will be helpful to you all right guys so now what we're going to be doing is we are going to be revising through dna so we're going to look at the discovery and the structure of dna and then we're also going to look at the structure and function of rna the discovery of DNA. So this um, structure and like, you know, the composition and stuff of DNA was discovered by three people, Watson and Crick and Ross and Franklin. Watson and Crick were both scientists and biologists respectively, and Franklin was also a scientist. So um, Watson and Crick both discovered the molecular structure of DNA, and later on, um, Rosalind, she created a technique that's called X-ray crystallography, which helped her to further study that DNA structure, and she discovered the helical shape of DNA. Furthermore, Watson and Crick um, discovered that the DNA was made up of two chains of nucleotide pairs that encode genetic information for all living things. Okay, so we all know that in our nucleus, um, well, in this kind of phase over here, right, um, all this DNA is compressed into the chromosome, but usually it's more like, you know, loose in a squiggle, and you'll see in my drawings, I always draw DNA that way. You don't find DNA in this form always, but you only find it in this form if it is going through some kind of a phase change. So like interphase and then going into like mitosis or meiosis. So yeah. But anyways, so in our nucleus, we have chromosomes, okay? So we have as humans, we have 46 chromosomes and we get 23 from our mother and 23 from our father. So now, what chromosomes do is that chromosomes are just compressed DNA. So your DNA um, wraps around these um, proteins that you don't have to know, but it's just extra information. So DNA gets wrapped around histones and then they get packed into this chromosome shape, like all these legs and the arms and stuff. So yeah. Um, so a chromosome is just basically your packed DNA. Now, what you find on your DNA is genetic code. Now, 
um, which you can also call genes. So genes basically, um, they are the code or like the sequence, yeah, they are the code that um, encodes for certain appearances, certain functions and stuff that you find on yourself. So like, um, like I'll give more, or I'll explain more on like, you know, genes later, but I'll just say it now again. So um, for instance, like genes will, genes give you the character characteristics like your skin color, your eye shape, your hair color, your height. Um, it also like, you know, the same thing applies in like other living organisms. So now with flowers, um, flowers, like it can be the color of the petals. It can be, um, what do you call it? The thickness of the stem and stuff like that. So genes can encode for appearances. Genes, um, code for proteins also. So like, um, I'll give an example. Um, we know that the sugar lactose, this is something that's like, you know, has been done in grade 10, but like the sugar lactose, um, you need an enzyme to break that down. So in a lot of people, um, or maybe some unlucky few like I, <laughs> um, we lack that, um, enzyme called lactase. So lactase is responsible for breaking down sugar. So we don't have the genetic information to um make this protein which is um to make this enzyme which is a protein called lactase so therefore we can't break down lactose it's not that like you know we'll die if you take in any like you know lactose in but it's just that we can't digest it it will be difficult for our body to break it down so yeah so you have your DNA that is packed in your chromosomes and um, what do you call it? You find your genes on your DNA. Okay, so now the role and structure of DNA. So DNA um, has like two roles. One is that it stores your hereditary information and it also contains a genetic code. So we know that us humans, we have 46 chromosomes, okay? And half of the chromosomes are gotten from um, each of the parents. So you get 23 from your mom, 23 from your dad. So now, what those chromosomes hold is, um, what do you call it, their information. So hereditary information is um, genes that you inherit from your parents, okay? And those genes, we can, um, we can list them as like um, genetic code. So what the genetic code does, like it encodes for certain features and stuff on your body. So for example, right? I am a short person. Um, I got these short genes from my dad. So now the genetic code for my height is found in my DNA, okay? So my hair color, my skin color, my eye shape, my nose shape, everything is gotten from my parents. And all of these things are stored in the DNA as little sequences of code. Now, the structure of DNA is as follows. DNA is a double-stranded molecule that is um, in a helical kind of shape. Okay, the monomers of DNA, we have four of them. So we have adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. So with these monomers, um, adenine and thymine bond together, cytosine and guanine bind together. So you'll find that on one strand of DNA and on another strand of DNA, they have all of these, um, these um, monomers, these nucleotides. Now, each of these nucleotides, they bond to their matching pair. So adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine that happens on the strands. So now these um, these nucleotides are bonded together by weak hydrogen bonds. Okay, so as we can see here, if we take a DNA molecule and we just unwind it and we just look at the two strands next to each other as such on the photo on the right hand side, we can see that the DNA is composed of two strands that run anti-parallel. Now, what anti-parallel means is this. So if we look at the structure of a nucleotide, we can see that it is composed of three things. The pentose sugar, the nitrogenous base, and the phosphate group. Now, the carbons on this ribose, on this pentose sugar, is labeled as 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, 4 prime, 5 prime. Okay, so the carbons in the structure are labeled in a clockwise direction, and the first one is bonded to the nitrogenous base, and the fifth carbon is bonded to the phosphate group. So the 5 and the 3 prime, they both indicate which end of the DNA strand that we're at. 
okay? And um, basically, the DNA strand can be defined like in terms of its direction. So five and three, they give us the direction of the DNA. So meaning that um, we can read DNA in a five prime to three prime direction or three prime to five prime, but generally um, we read it in a three prime to five prime. So let's look at these nucleotides that are bonded together. So on the left hand side, we have a three prime to five prime. So the nucleotide that is at the top, the uppermost one, that one ends with the five prime end of the carbon, okay? And the last one, the nucleotide at the bottom, the last end over there is the three. So we read this one in a three to five prime direction. And on the same thing applies on the opposite side. So the, the uppermost nucleotide has got the three prime end and the lower um, most one has got the five prime end. So that is in a three to five prime. So essentially, we just read it from the top to the bottom, and the one on the left side gets read from the bottom to the top. As a result, we can say that these strands run anti-parallel to each other. Now, take note of the bonds between the nitrogenous bases. So between adenine and thymine, we have two hydrogen bonds. Between cytosine and guanine, we have three hydrogen bonds. So this is why we can never have cytosine bonding to thymine or adenine binding to guanine. This is because of their chemical structure. So um, it only has like, you know, space, like adenine and thymine only have space for two hydrogen bonds and cytosine and guanine only have space for three hydrogen bonds. The last thing that you should know about the structure is that the pentose sugar and the phosphate group, they're the ones that form the backbone of the DNA. And now for the real moment that you guys have been waiting for, DNA replication. So just a few things before we get into the exact process of like how this is done. Um, DNA replication is very, very important that you know the location of where this occurs. DNA occurs in the nucleus. More specifically, it happens before mitosis or meiosis in the phase called interphase. Now, what happens in interphase? I'll leave that question up for you. I'm expecting an answer from you later. Okay, so just a short story before I get into more in depth with this, we're going to look at how DNA is replicated. So first we start off by you have your DNA that is coiled, then that becomes uncoiled, you're going to have your two strands, the bonds are going to break, then afterwards you're going to get your free nucleotides that are going to come and attach onto the DNA strands, and then afterwards those two strands will separate, forming two new DNA molecules. Okay, so let's start off with um, DNA replication. So this happens in the nucleus. We have our DNA that is like, you know, surrounded by the nuclear membrane. Here is our DNA that is supercoiled. Now we are going to unwind this helical structure and add in the hydrogen bonds that bind the two nitrogenous bases together. Okay, so next, the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases are broken down by an enzyme called helicase, not DNA polymerase, it's helicase. Now let's just zoom into the strands. Okay, so in the nucleus, you have free swimming or free floating nucleotides. These nucleotides got the nitrogenous bases on them. So what happens is an enzyme that's called DNA polymerase that comes, it collects this nucleotide and it binds it to the matching or its corresponding pair. So if we had T, for example, that's going to bond to A. And the next one with the T, that's going to bond to um, nitrogenous base with the A, with adenine. And then we'll have guanine binding to cytosine and so on and so forth. The same thing will happen on the opposite strand and both these processes occur at the same time. And thus, as a result, we end up with two identical DNA strands. Okay, so in summary, we have gone through the discovery of DNA, the role and structure of DNA, and we've also done kind of like an example of how this thing happens. So I'm expecting 100% in this section. Right, so now we're going to head up onto our break, a little four minute break. Please can you like think about all that I've like, you know, asked. If you're confused, then you have some time to ask some questions in the comment section below.
Oh, hey, you're back. I hope that you had a good break. So now we're going to continue with RNA. So we're going to study the role of RNA, the structure of RNA, and we're going to go through an example of how um, protein synthesis occurs. Now, RNA structure and role. So RNA is a single-stranded molecule, not like DNA where it is double-stranded, but it is a single-stranded molecule. It is composed of four molecules, cytosine, guanine, adenine, and uracil. Okay, so adenine and uracil bind together, where cytosine and guanine bind together. So um, if a question comes up where they ask you, like, tabulate the differences between RNA and DNA, the easy stuff you can say is that RNA is a single strand molecule, it um, contains the nucleotide uracil instead of thymine and when you tabulate differences you normally say RNA single stranded DNA double stranded RNA has got uracil DNA has got thymine so the role of RNA is to produce proteins so what happens is on our DNA um, sequence right we have specific regions on DNA that can encode for proteins so what happens is um, our DNA unwinds and that's the whole entire story and we generate a uh, an RNA strand and this RNA strand is going to be called the mRNA strand this is our messenger our messenger is responsible or holds the code for a specific type of protein that the DNA says um, should be made so let's call the process that RNA um, is involved in protein synthesis so protein synthesis can be just broken down into two um, phases. These two phases are known as translation and transcription. Transcription happens first, then translation follows on. So transcription is a process whereby um, a DNA sequence is copied in order to make an RNA molecule. And like I've said before, this RNA molecule is going to be called an mRNA, M standing for messenger. So transcription occurs on the three to five strand of the DNA molecule and the strand that results from this is a five to three strand. So this is going to be our mRNA strand as shown over there. Now transcription occurs in the nucleus. Um, the next process that follows on is called translation. Translation occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. Now pop quiz or maybe not really but anyways can you tell me which organelle is responsible for protein synthesis ah you guessed it ribosomes all right so translation the definition the official definition is the process where protein is synthesized from the information that is contained in the mrna so what happens is that your mrna is going to travel to your ribosome and then afterwards, you're going to get um, these tRNAs that are going to come and bind onto the codons of the mRNA, and they will form the, what do you call it, the amino acid sequence. So I'll describe this in more detail. Okay, so let's look at our DNA molecule that is coiled and is inside the nucleus. Okay, so this over here is our nuclear membrane. So now this is our DNA that is a double strand and it is a helical shape. Now let's unwind this helical shape um, of the DNA so we can expose the nucleotides. Furthermore, let's say that, or rather let's just focus on um, a sequence of 12 nucleotides on the DNA strands. Now I'm going to create a random sequence of nucleotides on this DNA strand and the complementary um, of this strand will be on the right hand strand. And then don't forget that these nucleotides are bonded by hydrogen bonds. Now in order for transcription to occur, the hydrogen bonds need to be broken down by this enzyme called helicase. So I'm going to label the strands, the three prime to five prime end, and another, the three prime to five prime end. These two are anti-parallel. So RNA, um, with RNA, the transcription occurs on the three prime to five prime end of the DNA strand. Therefore, this strand over here on the left, we are going to call it our template strand. 
This template strand is the one that encodes for the mRNA. Okay, so I just quickly redrew the template strand in a horizontal fashion so we can look at it more easily. Now, I just want you guys to note that the DNA is still intact. Only a portion of the DNA is unwound, the bonds are broken, so that the mRNA can be taken. So we're going to use the template strand and um, to create our mRNA sequence. Okay, so now still in the nucleus, we have our free swimming or free floating nucleotides, and they have their respective um, nitrogenous bases on them. Okay, so now our DNA polymerase is going to bind our adenine to thymine, or rather match it, and the rest of the nucleotide backbone is going to form. So now, because this is RNA synthesis, our adenine is going to bind to uracil. So uracil will appear there, and then afterwards, the rest of the strand, like you know, will form. So now we're going to have our DNA strand that is the 3 prime to 5 prime and the mRNA strand that is formed in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. So here we have our mRNA, the 5 prime end and the 3 prime end. So basically this mRNA molecule travels outside of the nucleus and it goes to the ribosome or a ribosome. Okay, so this mRNA molecule leaves the nucleus and it travels all the way to a ribosome. So now, in the ribosome, the ribosome has three sites. This is known as the A site, the P site, and the E site. So basically what happens is, this mRNA molecule, it moves into the A site. Then, can you guess what happens at this stage? I know, I know. So here we have another RNA molecule, but this RNA molecule is called a tRNA molecule. So this tRNA, the T in tRNA stands for transfer RNA. What it does is that it basically has three nucleotides at its base and it carries along with it an amino acid. So, say we had this, um, what do you call it? this tRNA had the nucleotide sequence UAC. Okay, just forgot to mention this part of this tRNA is known as the anti codon. This part of our mRNA is known as the codon. So basically, the anticodon and the codon need to match in order for this amino acid to be added onto a sequence of amino acids. So now, this tRNA carries the amino acid called MET, or rather methionine. So this tRNA will come, it would enter into the active sites of the ribosome and it would attach to its matching codon. When this happens, the whole entire sequence over here, so the mRNA and the tRNA, they will both shift into the P site. Now we have another tRNA molecule. which also has an anti-codon. And for the sake of this video, we're just gonna make sure that, um, we're just gonna add the correct tRNA sequence that's going to bind to the mRNA. So now, this tRNA with the sequence GGA, that carries the corresponding amino acid called proline, or rather pro. So now this tRNA is going to move to the ribosome, it's going to bond to its matching codon, and then the whole sequence will shift to the next phase. Now, I know my stuff don't fit, but it happens. So basically now, um, 
I can make it fit. When, when this tRNA molecule has joined into this, um, into the A site, and we have another one in the P site, then what happens is the amino acids between these two, T, um, these two RNA molecules, they bond together. Then this whole entire sequence shifts again. Now, the first, the first tRNA molecule will fall away. And at the same time, a new tRNA molecule that's carrying an amino acid, which has its anti-codon, and for the sake of it just matching over here, I'm going to have A, G, A. And this TR tRNA carries the amino acid called, I think it's serine, if I'm not mistaken. That will come, move into the active site, bind to its matching codon, and then the bond is formed between proline and the serine. And then the bond between proline and its tRNA will break, resulting in this. Now this will repeat again. So this process will continue to occur until a stop codon is reached. So we have three stop codons, U, A, A, U, A, G, U, G, A. These three do not code for any protein. They end the translation process. So say that our sequence over here I'm just adding on another, so instead of being 12, we're going to have 15. Say that our sequence over here is UGA. We're going to have a tRNA molecule. That doesn't have an amino acid, but it does have that matching sequence, ACT. That will come into the active site. It will bind to that, causing this thing to end. So basically what will happen is this whole entire sequence will shift again. And this little guy will fall away. Our mRNA molecule leaves the ribosome. And furthermore, it gets destroyed. So now we are left with this sequence of amino acids. So because we have more than three amino acids, this molecule is considered to be a polypeptide. Okay, guys, now let's just check out this real life animation of how um, this translation process occurs. This is pretty cool. The job of this mRNA is to carry the gene's message from the DNA out of the nucleus to a ribosome for production of the particular protein that this gene codes for. There can be several million ribosomes in a typical eukaryotic cell. These complex catalytic machines use the mRNA copy of the genetic information to assemble amino acid building blocks into the three-dimensional proteins that are essential for life. Let's see how it works. 
The ribosome is composed of one large and one small subunit that assemble around the messenger RNA, which then passes through the ribosome like a computer tape. The amino acid building blocks, that's the small glowing red molecules, are carried into the ribosome attached to specific transfer RNAs. That's the larger green molecules, also referred to as tRNA. The small subunit of the ribosome positions the mRNA so that it can be read in groups of three letters known as a codon. Each codon on the mRNA matches a corresponding anticodon on the base of a transfer RNA molecule. The larger subunit of the ribosome removes each amino acid and joins it onto the growing protein chain. As the mRNA is ratcheted through the ribosome, the mRNA sequence is translated into an amino acid sequence. There are three locations inside the ribosome, designated the A site, the P site, and the E site. The addition of each amino acid is a three-step cycle. First, the tRNA enters the ribosome at the A site and is tested for a codon-anticodon match with the mRNA. Next, provided there is a correct match, the tRNA is shifted to the P site and the amino acid it carries is added to the end of the amino acid chain. The mRNA is also ratcheted on three nucleotides or one codon. Thirdly, the spent tRNA is moved to the E site and then ejected from the ribosome to be recycled. As the protein synthesis proceeds, the finished chain emerges from the ribosome. It folds up into a precise shape determined by the exact order of amino acids. Thus, the central dogma explains how the four-letter DNA code is, quite literally, turned into flesh and blood. So this is the mRNA codon chart. So we use this um, to read up what the corresponding amino acid will be. So instead of looking at the tRNA, um, we look at the mRNA codons. So the tRNAs are so important because they have to match the mRNA in order to um, allow that amino acid to join the sequence. But otherwise, this is this. So you can see over there, methionine, the AUG over there, that is your um, start codon, okay? That is the first amino acid that will be found and your amino acid sequence does not start without methionine. And then you have your three stop um, codons, which are UAA, UAG, and UGA, as I've mentioned before. All right, so by now you should be a pro of DNA replication and protein synthesis. So from the DNA side, we should know that DNA, like you must know who discovered it, the people that discovered it, you should know the role of DNA, the structure of DNA, and how it is done. So don't forget, DNA is a double-stranded helical molecule, and you have your four monomers, adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine. And um, don't forget the name of the bonds that hold, like, you know, the nitrogenous bases together. The You don't have to know the name of the bond that holds the nitrogen the nucleotides together, that phosphodiester bond. But yeah, know that backbone and yeah, that's about the importance that I can pick out for now. And then from the RNA side, you should know that it is a single-stranded molecule. It contains four monomers, adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. Um, you should know the protein synthesis part, so um, the processes that takes place. So it is transcription and translation. So you have your mRNA that is transcribed and then it goes to the ribosome and its transcription is or transcript is translated into a sequence of amino acids that are all joined by peptide bonds. Do not forget the name of the peptide bonds. Okay and um, yeah that's just about it from my side I guess. So I just want to say to you guys Thank you so much for tuning in to this Tutor Box Live in conjunction with COVID-19 catch-up session. I hope to see you next time. And if you don't understand anything, then please don't be shy. 
ask questions down in the comments below and I will be able to help you out. Thank you so much for joining guys. It's not a matter of whether or not we can. Everybody can, but not everybody will. How to turn nothing into something. How tangible are ideas and imagination? Ideas that become so powerful in your mind and your consciousness, they seem real to you even before they become tangible. Imagination that is so strong that you can actually see it. You can actually see it. If somebody cannot see it when it is not here, then it will never be here. Start looking into the future of what you would like to accomplish, where you would like to go, the person you would like to be. Decide what you want and then act as if you already had it. And that is to believe that what you imagine is possible for you. So the first step is to imagine what's possible. Second step, to believe. Now here's the third step. And that is to go to work and make it real. You now go to work and make it a movement. You make it tangible. You make it viable. You breathe life into it, and then you construct it. You have a lot to offer. The fact that you're still here means that your business is not through yet. People don't do what they know in life, but what they do is they operate within the context of the vision they have of themselves. So write and draw and build and play and dance and live as only you can. Make up your own rules. The rules on what is possible and impossible were made by people who had not tested the bounds of the possible by going beyond them. You must change what's possible for you. You and only you are the subject that impacts the burning desire in your imagination. You are living and feeling as if your future dreams are a present fact. Will it be easy? No. Will it be challenging? Yes. So you got to prepare yourself. You've got to develop yourself. As long as you're breathing, you got some more work to do. There's something else for you to achieve. Guess what? You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. So now go and make interesting mistakes. Make amazing mistakes. Make glorious and fantastic mistakes. Break rules. Leave the world more interesting for your being here. Make good art. It is possible to start with nothing and become something.